Hello, welcome uh, everyone. Uh, this is our open uh, seminar uh, and my name is uh, Jan Piasecki and I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Professor Steven Lewandowski from the University of uh, Bristol uh, who will uh, give a speech uh, entitled Demagoguery, Technology and Cognition Addressing the Threats of, uh, to Democracy. And um, Professor uh, Lewandowski is a psychologist uh, currently working at the University of Bristol in the uh, United that kingdom, uh, but he is from Australia. He also worked in the uh, United States. His research currently focuses on misinformation, uh, corrections, uh, the biasing, the banking of uh, misinformation. Uh, currently, he co author uh, articles on ethical dilemmas uh, surrounding content moderation. And also, uh, he was a part of the big team of researchers who developed a toolbox uh, for uh, of intervention countering this uh, information. So, uh, r r right now, uh, in a second, I will I will pass the microphone to Professor Landowski. But later, after his uh, his speech. Uh, of course, every participant is invited into the discussion and it is possible to take part uh, in the, the discussion in two different ways. So you can raise your uh, virtual hand so I can see uh, that you want to ask a question or you can also send a question into the chat. I will be uh, screening what is appearing in the chat and and I will read uh, your questions uh, aloud to, to, to our to our guest. So uh, if there is uh, no any technical issue, I think that 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 we can start. Thank you. OK, thanks very much for the introduction. Yeah, I hope you can hear me and that you can see my slides. OK, very good. So yes, what I want to talk about today is um, my core research, which deals with uh, addressing threats to democracy and in particular um, the effects of misinformation. And I should start out by noting that this is a very uh, broad team that is uh, contributing to this research. Here are some of the people involved. Um, and I want to acknowledge them up front uh, together with my funders because, you know, none of this would have been possible uh, with without them. So the departure point for my research is the observation that democracy is um, in retreat in many countries. What I'm showing you here are data from an institute known as VDEM, which has been looking at um, the state of democracy around the world in many countries. And they have a measure that is a composite of a large number of indicators um, relating to electoral fairness, independent of the judiciary, and so on. And they publish these annual reports uh, that tell us how democracy is doing in uh, various different countries around the world. Now, on the graph that you can see, anything below the diagonal represents a decline uh, between 2011 and 2021. And as you can see, there's quite a few uh, countries below the diagonal, including uh, well-established democracies like the US. And unfortunately, you will see that Poland uh, and Hungary, uh, some European countries are also considerably below this diagonal, suggesting that in those countries, democracy is sort of shrinking. Uh, based on these indicators, and that is confirmed by other institutes. So, um, you know, I'm I'm moderately confident to say, well, we have a real problem there. So the question is, why? Why does that happen? Now, the you know, there's a multitude of answers 
to that question. I can't cover them all. All I can do is to focus on three major players um, in this space, and I can talk about how they interact in giving rise to this decline in democracy. And what I've chosen to focus on are those three things, what I call demagogues, the social media, and importantly, human cognition, that is all of us, and how we think uh, and how that affects uh, democracy. Now, I'm going to argue that demagogues in social media are in conflict, in a sense, with how we think when it relates to, as it relates to democracy. Demagogues in social media uh, can exploit the frailties of human cognition with adverse consequences for democracy. And I'm also going to argue that there is a natural affinity uh, between demagogues and social media, and that the two can reinforce each other in their negative effects on democracy. So what I want to do is I want to take up these three issues in turn and explore how they relate to each other. Starting out with what I call uh, demagogues, um, it's hard not to talk about Donald Trump when you're talking about misinformation or demagoguery because he was, uh, well, very good at it. If, if you count up his record of misleading claims, you find that according to fact checkers, he made more than 30,000 false or misleading claims during his presidency. Now we can debate one or the other of these claims and, you know, maybe there's some truth in them. But, you know, I think it's established beyond doubt that he was uh, uh, unique in his ability to uh, say things that had little connection to reality. So the question I want to ask, the first question I want to ask is, well, what's the fallout? What happened? What are the consequences if a politician is in power who basically is lying 20 times a day, roughly. Um, well, the first thing I want to examine is whether demagogues such as Donald Trump are able to set the agenda, the political agenda, the public agenda, and the agenda of the media. Now, this is an interesting question to observe because uh, in political science, the conventional wisdom, by that I mean research dating back to the 1970s, 80s, 90s, the conventional wisdom suggests that the media are the principal agents uh, of agenda setting. And there is quite a bit of support for that. Um, you know, you can, you can run experiments that show um, that the media are causal in setting the, the uh, agenda of public discussion, as has been done by these uh, researchers, but I would argue that that conventional wisdom may be out of date because I think, and I will show over the next few minutes, that social media affords an opportunity for agenda setting by others. You don't need mainstream media and their editors um, to set the agenda. Instead, you can be Donald Trump, and I will show you um how he has done that as one example in which demagogues can affect public discourse now i want you to think back to november 2016 this seems like a you know a very long time ago uh now with all the events that the world has has experienced since then uh and that was a time right after donald trump got elected but he hadn't assumed his position yet and one evening in November 2016, Donald Trump started um, tweeting vociferously, vigorously um, about an event that happened on Broadway at a theater performance. Um, he was very upset that his vice president elect was in attendance at a, at a play on Broadway and the audience at the end of the play 
was addressing Vice President-elect Pence and pleaded for a diverse America because they were concerned about um, the consequences of Donald Trump's election. Um, now, um, that caused quite a stir at the time. As you can see here from a Google Trends analysis, what this graph shows you is the number of times the public, the American public, searched for the terms Trump and Hamilton. And as you can see, around November uh, 19th, there was a major uptick <coughs> in that search term. Unsurprisingly, because Donald Trump tweeted about Hamilton extensively on that day. Now, uh, what is interesting here as a very suggestive hint, what's interesting is that the date of Donald Trump's Twitter campaign coincided with the day on which he settled the lawsuit against his so-called Trump University. He settled for $25 million, including a $1 million penalty to the state of New York. So this was not something that was good for him politically. And if you now look at that Google Trends graph again, you will discover that there is a blue line at the bottom, which uh, reflects the number of times people, the public in the United States searched Google for Trump University settlement. And as you can see, they didn't, not much, compared to the Trump Hamilton search term. Now, we can't draw too strong a conclusion from this, but as a first approximation, as a hint <laughs> that Donald Trump might be using Twitter to divert attention from something he doesn't like, as a first hint of that, uh, it, is, it is informative and uh, I find quite interesting. So what uh, my colleagues and I, uh, and I set out to do was to explore this possibility a bit more systematically. Might Donald Trump throw out these shiny objects? Might he be tweeting about something here to divert attention from over there, which is something that is damaging to him politically? So what we did uh, in this study uh, was to analyze all of the New York Times coverage and all of the ABC News headlines during a two year period, right at the beginning of Donald Trump's uh, presidency, during the Russia Mueller investigation. You may recall that there was a, a, um, a you know, investigation about possible collusion between uh, the Trump campaign during the election of the Russian government. Um, and all the reports about that investigation were arguably not good news to Donald Trump. At the time, it was for him politically damaging to have that uh, investigation ongoing. So what we then did was to relate the coverage um, in those two media outlets to Donald Trump's tweets. So we wanted to know whether we can detect a relationship between media coverage and Donald Trump's responses. And conversely, how would the media then respond to Donald Trump? That is what we were interested in, the interplay between this leading demagogue or leader, anyhow, uh, although he is a demagogue, um, and him and the media. So what we did was the following. And I now have to explain the graph here uh, a little bit before I go on and show you the data because you have to understand what the graph is, is plotting. But once you know, it'll be immediately obvious what it is showing. So what we did was throughout that two year time period, we looked at all possible uh, tweeted word pairs in Donald Trump's tweets. And there, there was like a thousand of them, obviously. There's a whole vocabulary that Donald Trump is using after you strip out all the function words and the relevant stuff. And then you can take, you know, two words in, in a pair, um, which will capture the meaning of a tweet because tweets are very short. So if you take two, pair, two words in a pair, you have a pretty good idea what the tweet is about. 
And so what we then did was to um, fit a regression model for each such possible pair and try to predict how often that would happen as a function of the coverage in the New York Times of the Russia Mueller investigation. And we then plot um, that regression coefficient on the x-axis. We then do another regression model that uh, looks at how the New York Times responds on the next day in terms of their Russia Mueller coverage as a function of Donald Trump's tweets from the day before. We plot that on the y-axis. Okay, what does that mean when I say that? Well, it means that each pair of words in Donald Trump's tweets has a position in this two-dimensional space. There's a pair X, whatever that may be. There's a pair Y, there's a pair uh, Z. You know, each word pair sits in this uh, space. And we can now, ahead of time, realize what should happen in this space of tweets uh, under various scenarios. Now, suppose it's all noise. Suppose nothing is happening. Uh, that is, whatever Donald Trump is tweeting has nothing to do with the New York Times, and whatever the New York Times is saying the next day has nothing to do with Donald Trump. Well, then all the tweets, all the, the word pairs would be a blob in the middle of the space centered on zero. There's just nothing, okay? So that's our null uh, distribution that we would effect, uh, expect. And we would in fact expect that for items that are of no consequence to Donald Trump, okay? Now, if uh, Donald Trump uh, tried to divert attention from Russia Mueller, then what should happen is that in response to the New York Times coverage, he should start tweeting stuff. He should become more active. And there should be points to the right because anything to the right means more of that in response to the New York Times covering Russia Mueller more. All right, we don't know yet what these word pairs might be. I have no idea. But there should be a whole bunch of points over to the right if Donald Trump uh, is responding systematically to the New York Times coverage. Now, if that is successful and the New York Times is then diverted and is suppressing its coverage of Russia Mueller the next day, then we should find those points to be in the lower right quadrant because being below zero on the y-axis means, oh, a reduced coverage as a consequence of those tweets the day before. So that gives us a guide to in interpret what I'm now showing you, which is the results of an analysis first looking at neutral words, uh, and then I'll turn to the interesting part, uh, which is the Russia Mueller investigation. So here we have four topics, economy, football, gardening, and skiing. Now the economy, we don't know, that could be relevant to Donald Trump. But football, gardening, skiing, you would think that that is pretty neutral and nothing much should happen. And that is precisely what you can see, because if you look in the top panel, you can see that all the light blue dots that, that are sitting there in the middle are within this red circle, which happens to be the 95% contour, the 95% uh, confidence contour of this analysis. And basically nothing happens, which is as, as you would expect. And the word clouds at the bottom, by the way, while well, they represent the coverage in the New York Times that we analyzed and they just confirm that when we look for articles on skiing, yeah, well, they're actually about skiing and the Olympics and mountains and so on. So that just confirms uh, that what we're talking about here is, is as intended something that with the exception of the economy is pretty unpolitical, okay? And Donald Trump, you know, does nothing. I mean, at most you can say that gardening puts him to sleep because there's a lot of points on the left and that means less coverage um, 
in response to gardening. I suspect that's because the New York Times mainly talks about gardening on weekends and maybe Donald Trump doesn't tweet as much on on weekends. All right, so that tells us that when we expect nothing, we get nothing. But what about Russia Mueller? Remember now, Anything about Russia Mueller would have been bad for Donald Trump. Uh, certainly, the New York Times, ABC News, they they you know they reported this without uh, at the same time trying to support Donald Trump. Now look what happens. What happens is this: when the New York Times reports on Russia Mueller, Donald Trump starts tweeting a hell of a lot more. A lot of points to the right. He gets very active, agitated, one could say, in response to New York Times coverage. And the next day, the New York Times, in response to some tweets, is reducing its coverage of Russia Mueller. They respond to Donald Trump by, by, by printing less about Russia Mueller. And that's what this point cloud in the bottom right is about. It sits outside the significance boundaries. So something significant is going on. And it's not just the New York Times. It is also the ABC headline news. So it's not just the print media. It's also the, the, the TV that shows precisely the same effect. And what's very interesting here is that under any other circumstance, the coverage in the New York Times and ABC News is actually uncorrelated. We looked at that. They do not tend to talk about the same thing, interestingly. But the moment Donald Trump tweets about Russia Mueller, their coverage becomes synchronized. There's a correlation there. And one aspect of the correlation is that um, coverage of Russia Mueller is depressed. So arguably, what is happening is that when the New York Times talks about Russia Mueller, and this is the word cloud on the left that tells you what the coverage is about, then Donald Trump starts tweeting like mad. What is he tweeting about? He is tweeting about the words you can see on the right. Those are the words in the pairs that were in this bottom right quadrant. That is what Donald Trump is talking about. Jobs, 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 China, tax, North Korea. Those were all uh, items of political strength that he's talking about. And he tweets more of that the more the New York Times uh, is covering Russia Mueller. And in consequence, the next day, the New York Times talks less about Russia Mueller. Now, the word clouds here exaggerate the effect size. The whole point of doing this animation is just to hammer home the point of what we are observing. And so what we are observing is that social media permits agenda setting by demagogues. Uh, the media can be diverted from issues that Donald Trump didn't like. So the question is, was it just Donald Trump who did this? Um, well, we looked at this very recently, my team and I, by looking at the tweets of all members of the US Congress between 2016 and 2022. This is 1.6 uh, million tweets that we looked at. Um, what we did was to extract all the links that were being tweeted and we checked whether the domains in those links were trustworthy or not. And we used something called NewsGuard, which is a uh, uh, commercial product that is employing journalists to go through systematic checklists to indicate the quality of each domain out there. Um, so it doesn't talk about individual articles. They're not fact checkers. They are credibility assessors. But nonetheless, if you constantly link something from a low quality source, then you're probably sharing misinformation. You know, sooner or later, you'll do that. Uh, if you share high quality sources, well, then not, not so much. And what we find is um, that 
the share of poor quality domains being shared uh, by members of Congress goes up the more they are on the ideological right. In the United States, red is Republican, blue is Democrats. And what you can see here is that there are more points uh, above that horizontal lines, which means <laughs> those are the people who share a large number of um, low quality sources. And among Democrats on the left, or, or even Republicans, if they're not ideologically that far on the right, um, you find that most of the points are below the horizontal line, which means they never share any low quality information. So um, this goes to show, you can see it here again, that over time, um, there, there clearly is a trend among one party, the Republican Party, to increasingly share low quality information. Um, so it's not just Donald Trump, it is also other members of his party who, since he got elected, um, have sort of drifted away from quality media more and more um, over time. Um, now, this is interesting to know because one of the things that we know from previous research by lots of people, Brendan Nyhan, Andy Guest, Jason Reifler, uh, they have shown repeatedly that conservative voters in the United States consume and share more misinformation than liberals. Now, that it was never clear, though, why that was. Um, it was just a statistical observation, and it's been, you know, there's no doubt that this is the case because it's been shown over and over and over again, and it doesn't matter how you look at it, you always find that. Um, now, one way in which you could explain that is by saying that political elites are significant vectors of misinformation, as we have shown in our study, and that the partisans are basically emulating uh, what is what their leaders are doing. So um, now that I think is an important conclusion to draw because it's our first indication that, you know, demagogues uh, have an affinity with social media because it permits them to set the agenda in ways that prior to social media arguably would not have been possible. So that is, I guess, my, my first conclusion I want to draw, that there is this uh, affinity. And now I want to examine, um, putting aside social media, I want to examine, well, how do demagogues affect how we think? What are the, what's the fallout of Donald Trump on our minds, on our cognition? How do people think in response to demagogues? My departure point for this analysis is this rather surprising finding, which is that throughout his presidency, most Republicans, three quarters of Republicans, consider Donald Trump to be honest. Now, bear in mind that the fact checkers have identified more than 30,000 false and misleading claims. So at first glance, you might wonder, well, wait a minute, what's going on here? How, how can somebody be honest who's wrong that often and who sometimes is clearly lying because he, he, he knows he's saying something that's not true? It's very easy to show. You know, I mean, uh, if he says I was in the White House all weekend, but in actual fact he was out golfing. Well, come on, that's a lie, right? You know, that we, we don't have to camouflage. It is just wrong to say that. It's dishonest. But the perception of honesty, where does this come from? Well, let's go back to day one of Donald Trump's presidency, where his press secretary uh, made the claim that uh, his inauguration, Trump's inauguration, was the largest audience to ever witness an inauguration. And he was clearly talking about people attending the inauguration in person. Now, that was not true. Um, and, you know, there's so much evidence for this not being true. We don't really have to discuss it. Here's a photo at the same time taken for Donald Trump and Barack Obama during his second term. Uh, Obama on the right, Trump on the left. There's no question. 
Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's hardly anybody attending Trump and uh, Obama to a crowd. No question that this claim was false. Now, why would somebody make that false claim when it is so easily disproven as in this particular case? Well, I would argue together with some other people that this so-called shock and chaos disinformation reflects an altered notion of truth. Um, that what, what matters is no longer what really happened, but what matters is what people think should have happened or what they feel is happening. And, you know, here's Donald Trump himself saying to his, his audience at a, at a rally, you know, just remember what you're seeing and what you're reading is not what's happening. Don't believe your lying eyes. Just let me tell you uh, what you should be seeing. That's the subtext to this. Of course, he didn't say that out loud, but that is the subtext to this. And people who follow Trump are okay with this and they participate in it. Now, here are data from an experiment done uh, a day or two after Donald Trump's inauguration where um, the experimenters presented participants with the two photos I've shown you from, um, um, from the inauguration and their task was to pick the photo with more people in it. Now, it couldn't be simpler. You, you, there's lots of people here and there are a few people there. Which has more people in it? Well, guess what? That one. And what the data here show are the error rates. So if you look at people who didn't vote or people who voted for Clinton, pretty much nobody picked the wrong picture. I mean, these error rates are just, you know, keystroke errors. Somebody just slipped. They're not real errors in the sense that people got it wrong. But now look at Trump voters, 11% and 26%. And the higher number, 26%, are highly educated Trump voters. The highly educated people pick the wrong photo 26% of the time, more than a quarter of the time. Why? Well, I would argue that they, they knew that there were fewer people attending Trump than Obama, so they knew which picture they should have picked. Uh, however, they also knew that it was political content, politically contentious and that Trump made a claim that was at odds with reality, but they support Trump. So they're going to pick the wrong picture to express their support for Trump and hence uh, to engage in what is called participatory propaganda, which is that when the partisans pick up the message set by a demagogue and then go with it and uh, and they do so to express their support for their favorite politician, irrespective of the accuracy. And here we can see that a quarter of Trump voters, highly educated Trump voters, were perfectly happy to pick the wrong picture knowingly. Don't tell me that their eyesight wasn't good enough. They knew what they were doing. They were expressing support for Donald Trump, which outweighed the evidence in front of them. Uh, now that's not altogether surprising when you then dig into this more, more deeply and look at the literature in political science and philosophy about the relationship between populism as expressed by Donald Trump and the truth. Now, populism, just to make sure we, we're on the same page here, is a political ideology that relies on, on, on one thing, and that, that is to divide the population into people and the elite. The elite is corrupt. The people are virtuous. Now, that's an entirely artificial construction because, of course, you know, depending on what country you're in, different populists will come up with completely different divisions. And, and there is no such thing as a monolithic people and a monolithic elite that are pitted against each other. It's ridiculous. Um, but that is what populism 
relies on, and it is inherently anti-democratic because it is negating pluralism. It is it is not acknowledging the possibility that different parts of the population may have very different opinions. No, for them, it's just either good or bad people versus elites. Now, the corollary of this is that populists invariably accuse the elites of lying, and they appeal to the common sense of people. And that means that they're denying truth seeking as a shared goal of society. And instead, they're appealing to authenticity as factual, replacing factual accuracy. What's authenticity? Well, authenticity is simply me saying what I feel in the moment and speaking my mind, being honest about how I feel, that is authenticity. And in a populist worldview, that's more important than accuracy. So if Donald Trump says, damn it, I have the largest audience, then that's the way he feels about it. And he's authentically speaking that belief. And it is that authentic belief speaking um, that his followers then consider to be honest. And we can see this all the time. We can, uh, you know, here, here's just some <laughs> explanation of this a bit more. Trump states falsehoods that are, that are easily disproven. You know, it's just ridiculous. Um, and one of the things that he and others, it's not just Donald Trump, it is populist leaders all around the world, what they're doing when they're telling these obvious lies is that they're flouting norms of truth telling, which rhetorically can be associated with the elite. And if you do that all the time, then you're signaling contempt for the elites or for the establishment. And you're signaling that you're authentically speaking your beliefs and that you are an authentic champion of the real people. So dishonesty within a populist logic uh, becomes uh, a marker of authenticity and of being um, a champion of the real people. And for the followers, uh, the lies become an opportunity to express their loyalty to a leader by buying into it, because then they too are in on the negation of establishment norms and that uh, participating in that loyalty is more important to them than factual accuracy. So there is um, Evidence for this here is a very nice paper by Hall et al., Oliver Hall et al., from a few years ago, uh, where they um, induced that in an experiment. They got people to accept lies by a politician under certain circumstances. And the circumstances are shown on this slide. If um, people feel that a system is corrupt or that they're excluded from it. And if they perceive a candidate to act on their behalf, then um, they will accept that candidate lying to them. That's okay, but only under these circumstances. If neither of these condition, conditions is satisfied, uh, lying again becomes unacceptable. So that tells us how demagogues interact with human cognition. They create a new conception of truth uh, all of a sudden. And that is what uh, we're observing, I think, in many places in the world. So now I want to turn briefly to the relationship between social media and human cognition, because that too, I think, is important to understand. And it is something that has adverse consequences uh, on democracy. So what is the relationship between social media and cognition? Well, uh, if you really want to know, I can recommend uh, that uh, 
uh, report that myself and others have recently written for the European Commission. Uh, it's at that link, sks.to slash techdem. It's publicly available. You can download it. That really covers a lot of it. Um, now, I can't talk about all of it today because I'm, I'm, uh, I only got about 15 or 20 minutes left. So um, just very briefly, what we did in this report and in other uh, uh, work, uh, we identified four pressure points between human cognition and social media uh, technology that are relevant to democracy. And they're shown here, attention economy, choice architectures, algorithmic content curation, and of course, misinformation and disinformation. Now, all I wanna talk, talk about briefly is the attention economy and algorithmic content curation, because at most I will have time to explain those two things. Now, the first thing we need to realize is that human attention, your attention, our attention, is the main product on social media. As a rule of thumb, if you're using something online that's free, you're not paying for it, well, that means you're being sold. <laughs> you are the product. Um, why? Well, because the longer users dwell on a platform, the more the platforms can sell ads to advertisers. So they want to keep you there, not because it's in your interest, but because it's in their interest to sell you ads. Just as an example, uh, YouTube by default has this autoplay feature, which means it never turns itself off. It'll keep playing videos for you for as long as, I mean, forever, basically, uh, just to keep you there. So you don't have to make a choice. It just pumps information out there. Now, that's not all bad. Uh, in principle, because it has enabled many free services. I use free services, free quote unquote, uh, all day. Google Maps, Google Mail, Google this, Google that. You know, that's all free. I'm using it. Lots of other things are free. I'm using it. Uh, wonderful stuff, but it comes with a cost. And the cost is this. The attention economy, as it is commonly called, has produced a fundamental misalignment uh, between producers and consumers. This was a, a point made by Plunkett, and let me just tell you what, what he said and what I fully endorse. That is that traditional markets, manufacturers who produce, you know, cars, toasters, skis, whatever, um, they make a profit by satisfying their consumers. And if the consumers don't like the product, the producers receive a signal. Now, um, that sort of works, not always, uh, but it sort of works because, you know, if, if a manufacturer is producing a car that blows up every time bumps it from behind, uh, then the consumers are going to stop buying that car. And that actually happened with the Ford Pinto in the 1970s. That thing blew up on impact, killed quite a few people, and consumers learned that and they stopped buying it. So the signal was received. Ford withdrew from this product pretty much and tried to fix it. So in a conventional market economy, I would argue that there is an imperfect but existent alignment between consumer preferences and the producer's interests. Now, in an attention economy, uh, that is no longer the case because the profit for the platforms, the producers in this case, um, has nothing to do with the consumer, the users. The platforms only care about the users to the extent that they keep them engaged so they can sell advertising to third parties. Now, what that means is that the market relationship in an attention economy is between the platforms and the advertisers. It's not between the platforms and the users primarily. So what happens if the users are dissatisfied? And what happens, more importantly, if the advertiser's interests are opposed or are conflicting with the well-being of users. What happens 
in in this new economy where uh, uh, everything is fundamentally misaligned compared to conventional markets. Now, to my mind, uh, that is a real problem. Here's uh, some of the uh, uh, key factors that P Peter Pomerantsev and I reviewed recently um, and that we have to be concerned with. The first thing is that human attention is captured by negative emotion. Uh, and the moment you realize that, and there's a lot of literature on this, we don't have to debate this, you know, humans pay attention to negative things. Uh, we can't help but look at a car crash when we drive past it. Um, you know, even even we even though we don't want to, <laughs> still we're drawn to to look at the uh, this tragic event. Um, so what follows from that is that disinformation or misinformation, which is by definition novel because it's made up and which is often designed to be outrage provoking, those attributes of disinformation all of a sudden become features that maximize platform profits. So in other, in other words, the very structure of online platforms incentivizes poor quality information. And that is a problem. Now, we have confirmed this. One of my postdocs, Almog Simpson, has done this uh, analysis. We looked here at 160,000 news media articles that were shared by members of, of the United States Congress. We determined the emotional slant of those articles. And we used NewsGuard again, which I explained before, as an assessment of the quality of the domain. And what we find is this. Uh, the more negative emotion is in those uh, articles, the lower the quality of the domain that they were shared from. So the more disgust, the lower the quality, the more fear is in those articles, the lower the quality, the more anger, the lower, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can see that all the uh, negative emotions have this varying relationship with quality of the news media. And now consider the fact <clears throat> that the money is where the where the negative emotion is. <coughs> that is <coughs> where the platforms make money because it captures people's attention. So the money is being made with the low quality information and this analysis is pointing in that direction all right so much for the attention economy and the problems it generates let's talk about the second uh, thing i have time to talk about namely algorithmic content curation now what do i mean by that what i mean by that is that anytime you look at anything on the internet chances are that some artificial intelligence, some algorithm is, is shaping that for you. It's curating it um, on Facebook, Twitter. What you see is, is ranked uh, by an algorithm that is trying to show you things you're likely to like. Why? Well, because if you like stuff, you stick around. And if you stick around, the platform is making more money because they can show you more ads. So it's as simple as that. They will show you stuff you like. They will try to satisfy your preferences. YouTube will show you videos that they think you will like. Now, that's great, sort of. You know, I don't object to that in principle, but it also means that uh, it might show you increasingly extreme content because um, it thinks that that would satisfy you more. And that is concerning because we have evidence from experiments that the uh, search engine ordering and the newsfeed rankings causally influence our preferences. So it makes a difference. Um, to, to what is being shown to us. We can show the effects uh, of that. Um, and that is concerning because 30% of views on YouTube, for example, just to illustrate, were determined by um, an algorithm, not consumer choice. 
Thirty percent of the time, people watch something that they never wanted to watch. They never typed in, in and they never clicked. They never searched. It was just shown to them uh, uh, spontaneously. Um, and of course, so we have to be concerned about that. The other thing that um, follows from this curation and the availability of algorithms is that advertisers can engage in something that is known as micro-targeting. What do I mean by micro-targeting? Well, it's based on the idea that the best ad in the world is the one you only show to the people who then buy your product. That's the most efficient use of advertising. You'd never show it to anybody who wouldn't buy it. You only show it to people who buy your product. That's the dream world of advertisers. Um, and that's fair enough, because if you show an ad to millions of people who don't want your product, well, all that does is to waste money. And that means prices go up. No one benefits, really. It's actually a good thing if advertising is effective, because then it lowers the cost um, of advertising, at least at night. And advertisers, marketers have been doing that since, yeah, I don't know, uh, certainly since the 1950s and quite possibly even before then. So they segment their audience in ways that make a lot of sense. I mean, you're not going to find much lipstick ads in motorcycle magazines. You're not going to find toys advertised on TV after bedtime, not nearly as much as during the day when all the kids are watching after school. You know, it makes a lot of sense to do this sort of audience segmentation. But there comes a point at which the segmentation uh, turns into manipulation, into micro-targeted manipulation. Let me show you an extreme case here that was reported some time ago. Uh, where it was revealed that Facebook's algorithms, uh, they could identify the moment when young people were feeling worthless or insecure. They had a real live tracking system of teenagers' emotions, which could then be used by advertisers in principle, in theory, to target their ads. Now, Facebook did not dispute the existence of the technology, but they said it was never available to advertisers. And I, you know, I have no position on that. I, I have no reason to say necessarily that they were telling us an untruth, but that capability exists. And somewhere along the line from this um, audience segmentation, which we can all endorse, to this extreme case of moment-to-moment -moment knowledge of somebody's emotions, somewhere along the line, we cross a boundary that, to my mind, is uh, not acceptable. And it isn't just me. That opinion is shared um, widely around the world. Here are results from a representative survey with samples of a thousand people in the U.S., the UK and Germany, where we probed people's awareness of artificial intelligence and more importantly in this context, their attitudes towards personalization, towards micro-targeting. And so let me show you the data just very briefly, give you a glimpse of, of what we found. And what we find in a nutshell is that in all three countries, the public rejects political personalization. Anything that is in red and orange means no, I don't like it. Anything in purple means yeah, I'm okay with that. Now, if you look at the bottom, recommending local events, movies, music, restaurants, shops, Everybody is happy with that if an algorithm tells you where you should go and, you know, what movie you should see based on your preferences. People don't mind, and I don't mind either. That's great. But now look at the top. Political campaign messages, newspaper front pages, that is where the public draws the line and says, whoa, no, that is not acceptable for me to be targeted on the basis of my personal characteristics by politicians. And this is strongest in Europe, in Germany, in the UK, 
attenuated in the US, but the pattern is the same. People do not like to be manipulated uh, by, uh, for political purposes. And they also don't like uh, the personal tragedies and, and other uh, uh, private events are being used to target them, such as their sexual orientation, political views, or other personal events. People don't like it if that is being used. They're okay with age and gender, but anything other than that, whoa, they don't like uh, for that to be used in micro-targeting. And very importantly, this is not politically polarized. In other words, um, Republicans and Democrats or conservatives and labor voters in the, in the UK, etc., they all agree on this, which is quite remarkable that there is no uh, polarization. So that has told us something about uh, the relationship between social media and human cognition, how it can have adverse consequences and how people feel about it. They don't like it. So the last question I want to discuss, and I believe I have about 10 minutes left because we start at 10 minutes after the hour, um, is I want to talk about countermeasures. How can we defang the demagogues? Well, at the heart of this, I think, is populism. Uh, as I've noted before, that is problematic because it's anti-democratic, even though it calls itself populism, it is uh, negating pluralism, it is therefore anti-democratic uh, in our common understanding of democracy. So we have a problem, but where is it coming from? Well, here are some data that are just a signpost in a possible direction. I'm not saying this is it, but it's interesting to look at. And what I'm showing you here are data about productivity um, and workers' wages in the United States between 1950 and about 1980, 1979 or something. What you can see is there are two lines and they're indistinguishable. And that is economics 101, as productivity goes up, as a worker produces more for the same amount of labor, their wages go up. Well, yeah, of course it does, because there's more money made uh, from the same amount of labor, and that is being shared with the worker, and of course, you know, the, the boss and the shareholders and all that. But nonetheless, there, there has been for decades this uh, coupling between increases in productivity and wages. Now look what happened in the last 40 years in the United States. Productivity has continued to increase. Uh, wages have been largely flat. And that difference between the two curves you can see there is a squintillion dollars and they're in the pockets of shareholders and the owners of companies. They're no longer being shared with workers. And guess what? People notice that, you know, they notice that, they know this. They may not be able to describe it in data, but they know what's going on. They're being left behind and somebody is making buckets of money. And then guess what? <laughs> if a demagogue comes along and says, well, elites, well, you know, the real people, that's very attractive all of a sudden. And indeed, there's evidence that inequality, which of course results from this, uh, is the driver of populism. And I mentioned earlier the study by Hall et al. that uh, people accept lying demagogues when they feel left behind. Well, look at the graph. They should feel left behind because they are left behind or have been, uh, certainly in the United States. Europe looks a little better, uh, but in the United States, it's very clear. So that is something we have to deal with. Huh. Easier said than done, but nonetheless, we must do it. What else can we do? Uh, well, we can protect deliberation. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is if you protect people against social media and demagoguery and, and all the shouting and yelling that is going on out there, then uh, people can make extremely good, well-considered and balanced decisions. We know that from research on deliberative assemblies or so-called mini-publics, where people get together in a room, 
literally a room, usually, usually it's not online, where they discuss controversial issues with the aid of experts and moderators. Let me give you a specific example. The Republic of Ireland, they had two referenda last 10 years or so on abortion and gay marriage, marriage equality. Now, these are extremely emotive, hot button issues. If you had a referendum on those issues in the UK or the United States, the, the, it would be just insanely polarized and probably would end up being violent. None of that happened in the, uh, in the Republic of Ireland. And one of the reasons it didn't is because they had uh, deliberative assemblies of randomly chosen citizens who spent a whole year discussing these issues ahead of the referenda with expert input, public submissions, moderated by a respected Supreme Court judge, and ultimately they made their recommendations public. They didn't tell people how to vote, but they explained the issues as they perceived them. And that was widely recognized as being representative of what Irish people felt. And so they could go to the polls uh, without this toxic um, polarization. Here is a summary of, of this, I think was the abortion. Yes, it's the abortion referendum. Um, you know, that's it. That's what the you know single page of recommendations or or kind of you know sort of issues. Uh, that's what the assembly came up with. But that focused people on the issues and not the demagoguery. Um, so there's nothing wrong with people if you protect them against demagogues. They can come up with uh, amazing stuff. And luckily, Ireland has been largely spared populism, more or less. Um, and, and this is one of the manifestations. Finally, we need to think about how to recreate social media for democracy. There are some people, here is one of them, who is pretty radical. Uh, uh, Shoshana says you can have Facebook or democracy, but not both. That's an extreme position to take, but Honestly, you know, from what I've seen and the analysis I presented today, there is at least some truth in that. Now, we can avoid that by a number of things. Here are some recommendations, uh, again, from the paper with Peter Pomerantsev, um, where we talk about transparency and how important it is to, to be transparent um, and to tell people um, about what algorithms do and why they're being targeted, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, we have to support uh, human cognition. Um, can I take another five minutes? Is that OK? I'm now yeah, happy with that. Then I will tell you a bit more about human cognition and how we can help people right now without redesigning the system, how we can help them survive uh, online and and do better. Now, there are two things I want to talk about. There's plenty of other stuff, but I only have time for two. Something called boosting and something calls, called inoculation. They're related but different. Boosting means that you teach people something to enhance their competence. Inoculation does a similar thing, but it does it by warning people how they might be misled. Okay, so slightly different aspects of what is effectively an intervention to assist people's cognition. Now, here's one example of this where we boosted people's ability to detect micro-targeting. Um, micro-targeting being the customization of political messages uh, towards their personalities. What we did in that experiment was that uh, people took a personality quiz, so we knew what their personality was. We then told them what their personality was, so they then became aware of themselves. And we then asked them to detect when an ad was targeting their personality. That's all we did, just detection. Did this ad um, target you? or not. And uh, we did this with 
pictures with ads for cosmetics. Um, there are two ads here. You can see people on the left and one person on the right. And guess what? Which one of those is appealing to extroverts? Yes, the one on the left, introverts on the right. If you don't know what extroversion introversion is, well, that's what we explain to participants in the experiment. Extroverts are people who are outgoing, who love loud parties, are in company, want to be in company. Introverts tend to stay at home, read books, right? Yeah, that's a thumbnail sketch of, of the two endpoints of the personality dimension. And when you tell people what their personality is, they all of a sudden become far better at detecting the ads. Their performance goes from just barely above chance to about 90% simply by telling them you're an introvert and this is what introversion means and bam oh, they can identify ads targeting introverts so it works extremely well now let me turn to inoculation the final thing i want to talk about um what we did there was to present people with brief videos between 30 and 90 seconds that explained to them how they might be misled by demagogues. After that treatment with brief videos, people become much better at discerning between high and low quality information. We in this paper ran an experiment in the field on YouTube. And uh, I'll skip, I, I don't have time for this. Uh, I could have shown you a video. We can do that later on, on your own time. And more recently, just a few months ago, Google did a study in the field in Poland, the Czech Republic and Slovakia, where they showed videos uh, to the general public uh, that inoculated them against misinformation relating to Ukrainian refugees. You obviously know there's lots of Ukrainian refugees, in particular in Poland. Um, those videos were viewed 38 million times overall and Google did a test as a follow up and found that there was an increased discernment, meaning that people in Poland became better at identifying misleading information that was trying to scapegoat Ukrainian refugees after they had been exposed to those videos in comparison to a control group that didn't. So. This is now beyond being an experiment. This is actually being rolled out on the basis of our research on the inoculation uh, by Google in the field. And it is shown again to be effective um, in this particular case. So I think I went over a little bit, but let me conclude. Um, we're facing threats, there's no question. Uh, democracy is at risk. Demagogues are very good at exploiting social media. We have problems online, as I've reviewed, but uh, that's not hopeless. There are also opportunities. Populism is not inevitable or invincible. Uh, in fact, I would argue that it probably has peaked in many countries, I'm, I mean, you know, it's very hard to tell, but they're, they're running out of, they're running out of lies that people buy into slowly. Um, we can envisage an internet for democracy and we can boost people and we can protect them against misinformation through inoculation. And each of these topics is worth another two hours of discussion, but I think I'll stop here and I will thank you for your attention very much. And I'm happy to take questions, of course. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for for very interesting lecture. And yes, we are waiting for uh, for your questions. Uh, yes. Jonas, please. Hello, uh, thank you very much for a super interesting talk. My name is uh, Jonas, comes from the University of Oslo. Um, I had a question regarding your uh, line of research uh, looking at how the mainstream media responds to uh, demagogues. Um, 
I, I was kind of curious on um, why do you think the mainstream media responds as it does and kind of buys into the distraction attempts of these demagogues? And would you suggest they should do instead what would be a sustainable strategy to kind of counter these attempts? Uh, excellent, uh, excellent question. Um, well, first of all, as we point out in the paper, I, I'm convinced that the New York Times isn't doing this because they want to or because they like Donald Trump. Uh, I mean, quite on the contrary, their stated position was to hold him accountable. Uh, they were quite you know, strong in their statements about Donald Trump and the importance to, to hold him accountable. So I don't for the moment think that this was an editorial decision. Um, what I do think is that editors and journalists are people just like the rest of us, and it takes very little um, for, for people to be influenced even when they don't know it. Um, and, and I think that is what is going on. Now, one of the problems the media do have, actually, notwithstanding what I just said about them resisting Donald Trump, I don't think the media, at least early on at the time when this research was done, I don't think they really understood what was happening. I don't think they understood that Donald Trump was uh, one of the world's best manipulators and that he was playing them like a piano and that he was out to undermine democracy, uh, as I think is now entirely obvious uh, after the events of January 6th. Uh, I don't think the media were, were prepared to see him for what he was, and that gave him a window into this. And they continue uh, um, to have problems along those lines relating to this notion of journalistic balance which predisposes journalists in a democracy to, to present both sides of the argument, which is terrific. Unless one side is always lying, then it's no longer terrific. Then you're facilitating their corrosion of democracy. And that shift from, you know, presenting balanced opinions to saying, whoa, 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 here's a guy who's just making these crazy claims, that took the media a long time. Um, it is only now after January 6th that the quality media in the United States will, will explicitly refer to Donald Trump's baseless claims about the election, uh, you know, and, and which, is, which is the only way to go because they were baseless. They were completely, I mean, just, just crazy town, right? And they served a political purpose and they, they almost topped democracy. I mean, you know, the US came incredibly close and it's not over yet. So it took the media a long time to get there uh, and they're still suffering a deficiency there. The same with, with, you know, trying to balance scientific opinions with denial on climate change. The media still sometimes falls into that trap. The BBC doesn't, you know, even though they have an explicit policy against that, they still fall into this trap because, Journalists are, um, you know, they, they like to be balanced and they're susceptible to a criticism that they're not being balanced, uh, uh, which is, I think, it's a slightly different story, but it's seriously problematic. We have one uh, question from our virtual uh, audience, so maybe I will read it out, but it's also available in the chat uh, section. So, uh, Laura Steinhoff is asking, was there any analysis done in the micro targeting research to see if there, uh, if there were significant differences between the German participants and the US? And is there more research done in this subject in non-English speaking countries? Yeah, very good question. Um, well, the first part were the differences between the German participants and the US. Well, yes and no. Um, Yes, in the sense that Germans overall were most concerned about their pr privacy and far less permissive than Americans. The British were more like the Germans, but not quite as extreme. Uh, so there were clear differences there between countries. However, the pattern was identical. By that, I mean both Americans and Germans liked political targeting the least. 
and both were happiest with having dinner recommendations or movies or something, okay? And that pattern across different topics was identical across the three countries. So depending on how you look at it, uh, uh, you can say, well, they were the same or different. Um, your point about research being done in non-English speaking countries is extremely important, of course, uh, and it is a, a um, it is a serious problem how much of this uh, research is focusing on the United States uh, or the UK, but far less so. Um, now, it is like it is changing. Uh, for example, the Google study I just presented took place in uh, Slovakia, the Czech Republic and Poland. So, so that's, you know, very different. Uh, we also now have an increasing number of articles that report data from places like India, uh, Kyrgyzstan. There was an inoculation study just done on the Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyzstan, whatever. Sorry, I don't even know the name. Um, and uh, etc. So it is broadening out. There, there are now papers appearing that did research in Nigeria, in Africa, in Asia. Um, but I totally agree with you. There's not enough of it, um, and and we have to overcome that. Um, in Europe, it's not quite as bad. There are other inoculation studies done by colleagues. Uh, at Cambridge, who looked again at Poland, Germany, and the UK. Um, and so it's <laughs> there's too much English speaking stuff happening, but it is beginning to broaden out. And by and large, you find the same effects wherever you go, which which doesn't surprise me. I mean, people think the same. It doesn't matter whether you're Polish or, or uh, British, your your cognition is going to be very similar in many in many ways. We have another question. Um, hello, this is uh, Mikhail Rozhe. I have a serious question and a non-serious question. Sorry, okay. the non-serious question is, uh, goes as follows. Uh, you picture Donald Trump as um, some kind of uh, social media genius. The, the picture presents him as a very cunning operator of, of social media, someone who's really very good at it. Um, and that does not align with the public um, impression of this uh, figure. It aligns with his self-reporting as one of the most intelligent people on the on Earth, uh, but that's not like, commonly shared among, among, for instance, us. Uh, so the, would you, would you uh, care to share your own opinion of that particular individual? Do, do you think that it is a pose, it's an actor. Is he more intelligent than he seems or or do, do, do we? So this yeah. is the, this is a no serious question. And the serious question is, do you see any way to align the incentives of social media platforms with the uh, inoculation? How, how would you go about that? OK, great questions. The first one is, OK, um, I think Donald Trump is extremely cunning. He he is he has the ability to to read a room and to manipulate it to his advantage. There's no question about that. Uh, I think he he is extremely good at that. He's also extremely good at capturing people's darkest feelings and exploiting them to his advantage. He, he, that is a skill. There's no question. You cannot be this good. Well, you cannot be this good at doing bad by accident, okay? Now, is that conventional intelligence? No, I don't think so. I don't think he's particularly uh, uh, intelligent. I see no evidence for that. Um, but that doesn't mean he can't be very manipulative and cunning. That's a different dimension uh, uh, from formal intelligence. So that's what I think is going on there with him. And he's also completely ruthless and has no morals. And, and that, gives you a lot of mileage in politics. Um, and and that is one of the problems with the American media. They just didn't realize quite what they were dealing with uh, early on. Second question. Um, yes, that that is the million dollar question, isn't it? How do you reform social media and their business model to, to get them out of this uh, uh, incentive of 
favoring bad information? Well, I think uh, one way to do this is through regulation. Um, and in Europe, the EU has taken steps in that direction that I think are very encouraging with the Digital Services Act and the Code of Conduct, because they're now holding the platforms accountable. They have to you know, justify what they're doing. And also, and to me, this is much more important than, than anything else. The EU is creating a new center called ECAT, European Center for Algorithmic Transparency in Seville in Spain. And that center is tasked with, um, what as the name says, with looking at platform data and auditing their algorithms. Um, so we understand how they operate and what is going on. And that is one of the things in the Digital Services Act that uh, is extremely important, namely the requirement for transparency by the platforms and their algorithms. And to me, that is the most promising angle to take because the moment we just don't know what's going on. Um, if we have independent researchers who act in the public interest, investigate the algorithms and audit them, then that'll change everything. Because once the public knows <laughs> for sure that Facebook is showing them stuff that they know to be false just to make money, uh, I don't think that's gonna go over terribly well. I think that'll generate political momentum then to, to fix that and to mandate uh, uh, attributes of the algorithm that are more compatible with democracy. That is what I think is the most promising aspect of, of this. Now, I'm putting a very optimistic spin on it in the sense that, you know, there's a lot of power out there that is aligned against it and politicians are susceptible to power. And so you don't know if they might not fall over. You, you never know until it's over. But certainly the, there are steps in the right direction. And that to me is key, is to have independent audits of algorithms and uh, uh, so we know what's going on and then um, design counter algorithms that do better than that. And there is literature on this out there. I mean, it's there's a recent paper by uh, Bagadi and uh, Nyhan and Reifler and all these people in Nature Human Behavior, where they showed what would happen if you redesign the recommender system in a news feed to take into account, I think it was audience diversity of the sources. The moment you do that, the algorithm will recommend things to people that are far higher in, in overall accuracy than they, they otherwise would. So we know what to do um to to make the algorithms more compatible with democracy and we just have to get there and it's an arms race and it's a race against time but it can be done uh, yeah, i see a question also from from our audience uh, sarah fisher asked i think that it might have uh, uh, missed uh, this during the talk in which uh, case, sorry, my question is uh, about the data showing that New York Times reduced the Russian Mueller coverage following Donald Trump's tweets. Uh, do you have uh, a way to compare this against natural uh, degradation of stories over time, especially now that news uh, cycles are so short? I guess my worry is that New York Times yeah. might have reduced their coverage the day after a story broke, regardless of uh, what Trump was up to. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, really fascinating. Thanks. Yes, uh, excellent question. And, and we do have at least partial answers. The first uh, answer is that we had so-called autocorrelations in the model. So we were modeling statistically this sort of natural drift that occurs over time. We also looked at, uh, I mean, we, we had like 100 or so control variables in the analyses. And so we were pretty confident that that was not the problem. Um, the other thing is we had all these neutral, these placebo analyses with gardening and skiing, which didn't show the same effect. So you would then again argue, well, okay, why would it show up here but not there? 
And finally, and that to me is, is perhaps most important, we also did an analysis using Brexit as uh, the topic. Now, Brexit was going on throughout, well, it's still going on, it never ends. Brexit will never end um, until we rejoin. Um, and um, that went on during the first two years of Trump's presidency. There was a lot of coverage in the New York Times and Trump, it was not politically damaging to Trump. On the contrary, he, of course, supported Brexit because it was his mates who were running it. Um, and we didn't find the effect I showed you for Russia Mueller, even though it was very comparable in terms of coverage, in terms of the duration, in terms of everything was very similar, except it wasn't damaging to Trump. And, and the pattern was completely different. It was a blob in the middle. There was no effect. So putting all that together makes us reasonably confident that we picked up a real effect here. But your question is excellent because, uh, I mean, it's an observational study, so there can always be something else we didn't account for. But we tried. <laughs> and we had lots of placebo analyses and 100 control variables, and it was still robust. Uh, do, do we have uh, any other questions here from the room? I can't see anything in the chat. So uh, I I also have a question um, because I, I also see a tension or maybe even a contradiction between, let's say, political change that we that are somehow required in order to to change the la landscape of regulation and how, how media and especially how social media um, are functioning and also to protect all the democratic mechanism which was already somehow uh, corrupted by, by the populists uh, in power. Uh, and this, this political change requires also a huge uh, political mo mo mobilization. So, so yes. also people who oppose demagogues and populists, they also want to uh, somehow exploit uh, the social me me media um, and weaknesses also of, of, of human emotion, but for the good, let's say. They want to, to, uh, they want to, to mobilize uh, yeah. their voters to go to the, to, to, to the polls and vote, uh, let's say, this bad actors. So, so have you thought about how we can navigate this particular contradiction? Yes, it's it's a very good uh, point, and I think you're absolutely right. It is it is uh, it's very difficult. It it is uh, difficult to deal with that. So let me let me give you a few partial answers. Um, first of all. I think there is an inherent asymmetry between the information that demagogues pump out and those that people who oppose them are using. Um, now, by definition almost, anything that is being pumped out by demagogues, by populists, sooner or later will be false. You know, because it has to be. You you cannot be Donald Trump and and be telling the truth in the conventional sense, because then you would have no case. You you would have nothing to stand on. You know, you have to demonize immigrants, and the only way you can demonize immigrants is by making stuff up. Because if you looked at the data, then you'd find that immigration in most cases is a bonus uh, for the country that immigrants come to. There's a lot of evidence for that. You know, immigrants are a positive contribution to a country because they tend to work hard, they're young, so they don't have as many medical expenses, they pay tax, they hire other people. I mean, you know, especially in the UK, it is, this country needs immigrants. Um, and so, uh, you know, those are the data. And then the demagogues have to whip up fear by telling lies, basically, or exaggerating uh, isolated incidents. Um, and I don't think that the people who mobilize against demagogues have to do that. I, I, I'm not saying they don't also sometimes lie, but on, on average, they don't have to do that. Um, and if you look at all the, the fact checking during the election campaigns in the United States uh, over time, you know, there's always an asymmetry. 
um, in terms of what fact checkers pick up, you know. And in a nutshell, Democrats lie less. It's it's as simple as that. I showed you the data from the Congress uh, analysis. There's a huge discrepancy between the parties. Um, so so it's not the case that there is complete symmetry, which would make it hopeless to differentiate. I think if you found a way to cut down on highly emotive and false information with a magic wand, you would penalize the bad guys more than the good guys. And and I do believe that populism is bad because it is uh, toxic to democracy. So I think that's that's one thing to put on the table. And the same thing is true for inoculation. People ask me this all the time. Well, you inoculate people against being misled, but how do you know that you're not also inoculating them against good information? And the answer is that, you know, if, if you, if you use good information, you're not going to be scapegoating people. You're not going to be incoherent. You're not going to be emotive. You're not going to cherry pick. You're not going to jump to generalizations. All these misleading rhetorical techniques. People, scientists, for example, do not engage in that by and large, right? Um, so we can tell what the quality of information is that is that is poor and that is that is better. You know, we have a history of 300 years of looking at argumentation and we know that, you know, what bad arguments look like so we can teach people to detect them. And that means on average, they will only reject things that are that are of poor quality. So I think that's that they're, they're, it's not a symmetry. It's not an informational symmetry. And I think that's key to the issue. Specifically, how you would do that in the case of social media and how you would revise algorithms without also penalizing people who want to defend democracy, that's very tough and I don't have a good answer to that. But I do know there's an asymmetry in the quality of information, there's no question. And so if the algorithm favors quality, it's going to favor people who support democracy and it will uh, uh, work against people who are trying to undermine it. Do we have any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, hi, hello, this is Rafa Ringo. Thank you for a fantastic talk. Um, I wanted to, I have one very brief question. Um, you mentioned the study by Matchkovich from 2017 about the, um, um, about the uh, Facebook, uh, um, somehow targeting people feeling worthless and uh, insecure, right? This is, I found the study, the mention about this study right now in, a, 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 in the internet. And I was wondering whether um, you are aware of, or what is your opinion about uh, kind of um, uh, boosting manipulation, which could, uh, no, no, for, first, whether people who experience such a state and negative emotional states are more vulnerable to demagoguery or you know uh, uh, misinformation or uh, and and following up whether you think it will be possible to apply manipulation based on uh, somehow um, making people aware of being in such a uh, in such a state. Yeah. And then and then they use it as uh, against misinformation. And the second, a little but very short question: uh, What is your opinion about about uh, these processes in China, where where social media are completely different, and uh, also the kind of democracy they have is a little bit also different? And this could be fantastic uh, field for exploration um, and comparison with uh, the normal. Um, yeah. Okay. Normal world, our world, I would say. Yes, thank you. Excellent points. Um, okay, your first point about can you, I understood your first main point to be, can you boost people's ability to detect when they themselves are particularly vulnerable and then protect them against manipulation? Um, I don't know. I suspect that is going to be quite difficult because um, you know, if you're vulnerable, you're vulnerable because 
you know, certain things have broken down. I mean, if you're if you're already, let's say you're depressed. Well, you, you got there because something has failed. OK, so it's it's unclear to me how you can then say to people, oh, by the way, when you're depressed, do this. Well, if it were that easy, they probably would do it anyway. So they're not depressed, if you know what I mean. You know, it's 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 very difficult to to do that. However, um, it is, of course, possible in, in a therapeutic context over over the over longer term, over the longer terms to give people techniques to deal with uh, when they are feeling vulnerable. I mean, that is part of therapy is to let people recognize cues and give them things to act so they don't then fall into depression. So, you know, but that's not boosting sort of quickly something uh, uh, you can do online. Um, now, the second point about China uh, is a very interesting point. Um, one of the fascinating things about China is that, well, two things. Number one, they, don't exercise much censorship. Uh, now, let me, let me, let me, I mean, they do, <laughs> but, but it's not the way you think, perhaps. Um, very little content in China is removed, relatively speaking. The censors do not yank things off the internet. What they do instead is two things. Number one, they flood um, social media with distracting information. They do what Donald Trump does. And there is quite a bit of evidence for that. And there is something called the, the one cent army or something, uh, which is lots of people in China being employed by the government for minimal pay to put posts on social media that are distracting the public from other issues. There are classic cases, for example, involving an earthquake in, I mean, some time ago, where uh, there was a lot of stuff on social media about the earthquake and how many people were killed and how inadequate the government response was. And so the government obviously didn't like that. So what they did was to mobilize thousands of people to post about some sex scandal of some actress, uh, something that happened a year earlier that no one cared about anymore. But they managed to drown out coverage of the earthquake by having by pumping out the stuff about the sex scandal and enough people sort of then got into it and let go of the earthquake. So they, that's called flooding. They do that a great deal, similar to what Donald Trump does incidentally. And the other thing the Chinese government does a lot of is what's called friction. They don't make it impossible, but they make it harder to get at information they don't like or to spread information they don't like. So, you know, they ban the BBC. You can't get to the BBC from China. Well, except you can you can get a VPN and then you can go to the BBC, right? So um, it is actually very easy to go to the BBC or CNN or whatever from China. All you need is a VPN. But the number of people who A, know what that is, and B, who can be bothered uh, is so small that the Chinese government doesn't have to prevent complete access. They don't have to. All they got to do is make it harder. And then 98% of the people uh, just don't bother. And their purpose is achieved. And the same with censorship. They don't totally censor things the way it used to be done. You know, Stalin had his people who would just sort of, you know, rip apart the books and ban content. Uh, these days, they, they um, uh, autocracies don't do that as much because they have other tools at their disposal that are much more effective. They just drown out the good stuff with their own nonsense and achieve the same purpose. But no one can cry censorship. So we can learn from that, but I think <laughs> I, I don't want to. I don't consider China to be a model of internet governance. Let's put it that way. I don't. <laughs> um, it's it's what we want to avoid as well.
Thanks. I, I, I can see any questions from the audience, but maybe I, I ask the last the, the last question and quite recently I, I, I've seen uh, Elon Musk uh, encouraging government officials and uh, leaders to speak themselves and so so do you think that that this is this would be a positive trend that let's say politicians would have this kind of contact with their uh, constituents without any intermediaries without media without uh, people who who can somehow critically um, approach what what they what they are they are uh, talking about and uh, uh, what do you think what will be the 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 new the new the nearest future of of our uh, com communication especially when we uh, take into consideration the the crisis of tra traditional media outlets Yes, well, I'm I'm not against politicians uh, tweeting or or being in touch with their constituents. Um, I just think they should be bound by conventions and norms that are democratic. Um, I don't mind, you know, Joe Biden's Twitter account. I, I, you know, I'm perfectly happy for him to tweet and to people for people then to reply to that. Um, so it's not the in, that I'm in principle opposed to to politicians having a direct line to the public. Quite on the contrary, I think it's terrific. Um, but that doesn't sh that shouldn't give politicians a license to to do what Donald Trump has done, which is to lie and to undermine democracy and to effectively try and to overthrow it. Um, you know, that that doesn't follow. They're, they're two different things. And now, of course, the difficulty is how do you enforce the line? Who draws the boundary and all that? That's a separate issue. In principle, I don't have a problem. Of course not. I mean, you know, in the United Kingdom here, the um, every MP um, has what's called a clinic uh, with his or her constituents. And that's some sort of office hour I don't know, on a weekly basis or once a month or something. I don't know. Uh, but you, you just knock on the door, you walk in and you you take a seat and then you talk to your MP. Uh, that's a tradition that's gone back hundreds of years and uh, they're still doing it. Um, so, you know, I mean, I think that's potentially a good thing to, to have that contact, of course. Yes, yes, but uh, I also had on uh, my mind uh, uh, the thing that, let's say, that then we have to take into consideration this content moderation and all policies uh, for pol politicians and public of officials who, for instance, can be, let's say, censored or uh, suspended for breaking the rules of a given social platform. And some, some argue that, uh, let's say, that having access to uh, your audience is a kind of a uh, of right of uh, in 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 our time so uh, social media platforms should not be allowed for instance to suspend uh, social media accounts of public of officials who were uh, elected in democratic uh, Elections, and of course, we are coming back to 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 Donald Trump and and, and his, uh, his uh, and his Twitter account and Facebook account, which were suspended after uh, January six. And yeah. Okay. Um, yes. Well, first of all. Um, <laughs> The big issue we have to address is to what extent we want to have private corporations acting to govern public spaces. That to me is a fundamental question. And I personally think that the events surrounding Elon Musk and Twitter have shown us that we cannot afford to have uh, private corporations in control of public spaces. Um, you know, we, we got to have public control over public spaces. No one would have would have let Twitter do what it has done over time 
uh, had it been planned at the time and and had a formal proposal been made, oh, this is what I'm going to do. The only reason we have what we have now is because it evolved over time and no one knew what was happening because it was new technology and it was all exciting and interesting and no one really knew. And then all of a sudden, oh my God, we woke up and here's this monster. Um, so <laughs> I think that's a fundamental question to ask. And, and I have an opinion on that, which is we need public ownership for public spaces. Um, Beyond that, decisions about banning and moderating and all that kind of stuff, well, they're extremely tricky and nuanced. And this paper, I think you mentioned that when you introduced me, that I published uh, with colleagues about a week ago. Um, we looked at you know, a very large sample of Americans, a representative sample, to pull their views on moderation and banning and so on. And it turns out that most people, many people are in favor of content moderation and even banning if the consequences of misinformation are severe and if the person is a repeat offender. So the public is, is uh, uh, actually very comfortable with the idea of uh, moderation in extreme cases. Um, but I guess what we didn't ask them was whether they <laughs> whether they want a private company to do this or or a public body. That that we didn't ask them. Uh, so I don't know how people feel about that. I suspect there would be a difference along party lines on that one. Uh, um, yeah, but so I think that's a very subtle question though, completely, yeah. We have to talk about that some more. Thank you very much for, for, for your response. I can't see any other questions. We, we don't have also any question in, 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 in the chat, but uh, that was a very long uh, lecture and a seminar. So, so and of course, very, very interesting. So thank you again. Well, for thank you for having me. Being Great questions. Answers. Yeah. And of course, everything will be later uh, available on our website. Uh, and so once again, thank you and bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you.